away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Go away from me. In light of the power and presence of God, it makes sense that Peter's reaction would be to focus on his own unworthiness. When we encounter the full force of Jesus' glory, whether in the form of amazing grace or miraculous abundance, who among us has not thought along with the psalmist, who are we that you are mindful of us? Who am I, O oh God, that you are mindful of me? But we should remember that it is the power and presence of God that actually make us aware that God thinks of us. It is the power and presence of God that make us aware that God is prompting, that God is calling, that God is nudging us in some kind of way. That when Jesus calls us to the work of discipleship, yes, and Jesus does, when Jesus summons us to the work of discipleship and to the work of the reign of God, our willing response may be far more important than our own human judgment of our unworthiness. If you didn't get that, you're going to get it soon. You see, in the church in which I grew up, there was an outsized focus on our unworthiness. According to that theology, there could be no relationship with Jesus unless and until one sufficiently ridded oneself of all possible individual sins. The ones you knew about and the ones you didn't know about and the one you might do tomorrow when you forget. And this meant that where, you know, it meant that if you were not perfect, according to the subjective theological judgment of an authority figure, you were not available for discipleship. And it certainly meant that if you were lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, or queer in any kind of way, which everyone was convinced was a sin, even though there is no biblical warrant to think it so, you were prohibited from a life of discipleship. But I want to point out something to you. Jesus' encounter with and call of the first disciples in the Gospel of Luke simply do not follow that pattern. I'm going to go a little bit further here. Jesus' encounter with anybody from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, do, do, they do not follow that pattern. And if anyone tells you it does, tell them to come and see me. And we'll read every word, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Point out to me if Jesus' encounter follows that model. On the contrary, this encounter and this call of the first disciples began with the proclaiming of the good news. Yes, Jesus has been proclaiming this good news ever since he was in that synagogue and the people tried to kill him. Jesus has been revealing good news, revealing God, revealing God in the midst of ordinary working and poor people by preaching good news to them, proclaiming release to the captives, recovered sight for the blind, liberation for the oppressed, and declaring God's jubilee has now arrived. Jesus' message is not dependent on anybody's worthiness. It's not dependent on anybody's It is a free gift of grace from God. Jesus' revelation of God is not revealed or withheld according to human whim. It is a manifestation of who Jesus is. And people were so hungry for it. They, they had never heard anything like this. They were so hungry for that message and that revelation that they pressed in on Jesus to hear the good news. And Jesus asked Peter if he could use one of his boats as a pulpit and told Peter to push it away from the shore so that he can look out and, 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 and teach the people. Doesn't this look like the bow of a ship? 
so that he can preach and tell them the good news. And nobody was asked to leave because there weren't, they weren't all together or because they didn't believe or because they were different in some way. If Jesus did that, he wouldn't have needed the boat. But all of them, come, just come so I can give you this good news. And there were likely to have been people in that audience who had fallen short, who, who, who just wasn't perfect, including those first disciples, Peter, James, and John. But, 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 but Jesus has a far more important task here than figuring out who's unworthy. Jesus has a far more ta- important task than sort of thinning out the crowd. Jesus has a far more important task than what we've imposed on Jesus. Jesus is looking for followers, For people who would be transformed in such a way that they would catch other followers. And so he does two very powerful things that I think the church would be wise to remember. He he does two powerful things. He preached good news and he revealed the power and presence of God in a miracle of abundance. And when Jesus preached the good news, here's what did not happen. Jesus did not offer good news by calling the people sinners or by condemning them first. He just offered the good news. He just started telling the good news. He didn't point out like, hey, you, get up, you're wrong. He just started offering the good news. That's what he did. Whoever they were, whatever their vocation, wherever they had been, this gospel was for them and for their salvation. It didn't matter who they were. It only mattered that they were. And when Jesus told Peter to go into the deep water, when Peter listened to what Jesus said, and, you know, come on, you know me, you know us. If Jesus come on our job and tell us to do something like, Jesus, I know what I'm doing. (laughs) But when Jesus told Peter, the fisherman, to go deeper, he he, well, you know, we did it, but we'll do it again. But when, when Jesus told Peter to go deep in the water, when Peter listened to what Jesus said and did what Jesus told him to do, they caught so much fish, it almost broke their nets and they had to call for extra boats just to, to gather all of this abundance. Peter saw that revelation. It was epiphany. And Peter realized that he had just seen the power and presence of God. And his first reaction was to fall to his knees in fear and worship and declare his unworthiness. And what did Jesus say? I'm not interested in whether or not you think you are worthy or unworthy. I gave you good news. I showed you the power of God. Now go and catch folk. Go and tell somebody else what you just heard and what you just saw. And Jesus reassured him, reassured Peter, reassured John and James and the disciples, all of them, that he was calling to the service. He was calling them to discipleship. Another thing I want to do, I want to point out something something else that did not happen. Peter did not interpret God's abundance as a mark of personal prosperity. Now, I'm about to get in trouble. Peter did not interpret God's abundance as a mark of personal prosperity. Peter, John, and James did not conclude from this experience that Jesus, this miracle of abundance that Jesus means that God wants us to be rich. We should expand our business now and corner the market on the lake of Gennesaret and build houses and take care of our families. No, they didn't do that. No, when they realized who Jesus was and that he was calling them to catch other people, they left everything and followed him. Oh, don't go tell anybody, I said, Pastor told me not to enjoy my blessing. I'm just trying to explain something to you. That in the presence of the good news and of God's miracle of abundance, 
that sometimes it's a tip-off that we have been called to go and let somebody else know that we've heard the good news and that we have seen God revealed and we've been blessed. And maybe, just maybe, that's the same blessing that's available to you. That's what Peter, John, and James did. And it may be odd to you that I'm spending so much time telling you what did not happen in this story. However, I think it's important that we look at that because given what the church has done with Jesus and the call to discipleship, I want us to let this epiphany story give us pause. I want us to begin to look anew at what it means to take on discipleship. We need to take a pause. We need to take a pause from a religious perspective that says that because people are not in my church or part of my denomination, they cannot be disciples. We need to take a pause from a theology that says that our failures and our shortcomings disqualify us from seeing the revelation of God in our lives. We need to pause for something that said that because I'm not completely perfect according to someone's judgment, that I cannot be used for and by God for God's reign. We need to pause from this belief that, you know, of rejecting and excluding people from discipleship because of our ideological disagreements or, or our biases and prejudices about their race or their sex or their sexuality or their gender expression. We need to pause from enlisting Jesus on our side against Jews and Muslims and people of other faiths. We need to pause from using Jesus to justify wealth for a few and poverty for the many. That's the good news and the revelation. Jesus came preaching good news. Jesus Jesus came revealing the power and presence of God through a miraculous abundance. But Jesus never pulled out a checklist to see who met the criteria for receiving that good news or enjoying God's abundance. Never did it. And so what does that mean, Pastor? What that means is we are a bunch of fishers in this congregation. We are a bunch of people, ordinary folk, who are potential disciples and catchers of people. We are a bunch of ordinary folk coming here for any number of reasons, sitting here waiting for good news and hoping for a revelation of the glory of God. And I'm here to tell you right now that each and every one of us is not only worthy of the call, but that God is calling you right now. It's not a question of whether we're worthy or unworthy. It's a question of whether or not you heard God give you the good news and you saw the abundance of God in your presence. Did you see it? Did you hear it? That's the question. So whoever we are, whatever our vocations are, wherever we've been, whatever we've done, Jesus stands before us preaching good news, preaching rescue and recovery, preaching liberation from all that binds us. And I know, I know, I know it to be true. I know it to be true. Some of us have stopped looking and stopped listening because we've been told for so long that we are not worthy. Some of us have stopped looking and listening because we think we have to be perfect before we can hear the revelation of God. Some of us stop looking and listening because we think, oh, it can't be for me because I'm this, I'm that, or I haven't done it right. Some of us have sat there and closed our minds to the possibilities because if we don't look like A minister. I keep thinking about, I can't get it out of my mind. I even thought about whether or not it said, I I wonder, I don't even know if he realized he did it, but Steven Spielberg in the movie The Color Purple, if you haven't seen it, you should see it. There's a scene that I think embodies the message of Epiphany. And I just thought about it I, this week. I couldn't keep my mind off it. It, it. it seemed like a summons of discipleship that if we'd only pay attention. In one of the major scenes on one side of the creek is a juke joint, a little lean-to club, and they sing the blues. And it's filled with the sinners who've been kicked out of the church. And on the other side of the creek is the church. And the people have gathered for Sunday worship. And the preacher is bringing the message. He's right there in 
in his preacherly garb and he's doing it. But the congregation can barely hear him over the music coming from the juke joint. That means they are hopping. And they can barely hear. And, and it, it just so happens that the performer that night happens to be the preacher's own daughter, Shug. And people from all over had come to hear her sing. And so the preacher is still trying to preach. His daughter, who's been disowned by him, is, 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 as a sinner, she's singing. But realizing that the preacher can't talk over the music, someone in the church told the, tells the choir, sing, God is trying to tell you something. And so the choir starts singing this song, God is trying to tell you something. God is trying to reveal something. God is trying to, and they start singing. The choir starts singing this song. And as Suge is performing in the juke joint, she hears this song. God is trying to tell you something. And she stops singing. And it's as if a memory, a light bulb goes in her head and she remembers that she sang that very song when she was in church. And so she moves away from the song that she was singing and begins to sing. God is trying to tell you right there to all the so-called sinners. She's singing. God is trying to tell you something. And they all rush out of the club and run toward the church. And they burst through the door singing right along with the choir folk. God is trying to tell you. So right there, all of them, the people who've been in church the whole time and the sinners who've been partying all night, all in the same place singing. God is trying to tell you something. And she comes, she comes to her father right there and she whispers into his ear. See, daddy, sinners have souls too. And I thought about that scene. I keep thinking about the scene because that church, he kicked out his own daughter. He'd been so busy talking. He was so busy preaching at his daughter that he couldn't catch her. But it's when people allow, the, allow God to move in the singing. All those folk who had been, who'd been rejected by the church, who had been called sinners and, and unrepentant and backsliding, they were caught. They were caught. So my message to us today right now is that it is quite easy to move from fishers to ministers. We've been told it was hard, but it's quite easy. First is accepting the good news that Jesus has for us. It's perceiving, opening our minds that, that God is, is being revealed in that message. And then drop those nets, drop those bindings, drop all the things that hold us back and run out and catch other people because they're looking for it too. Amen.